Thanks to all of you who've opened your wallets once again this evening. All of us at CE, as well as our students and teachers, are grateful. Now it's time for the second part of our evening, the fireside chat. As Steve said, I'm the bridge to that. Yes, Nana's bridge. Well, it's all about infrastructure this year right now, isn't it? Anyway, actually this year it seemed particularly apt for me to speak at this juncture in the evening. The natural transition from the seeds planted by educating our children in these subjects to the oak trees grown sturdy and strong in the work of our visionary ward honorees. Our honorees all transform aspiration into reality. Utilizing economics, corporate management, and finance, they improve countless lives for women, minorities, hourly workers, for all those on the outside of networks, access, and to specialized knowledge. All of us gathered here know the leverage that those things give us. We don't enter a bank or a financial relationship ashamed or afraid of being shamed. We aren't unbanked or under leveraged as are so many small and minority owned businesses. We aren't intimidated but we, by what we don't know because our baseline knowledge makes it possible to differentiate a sales pitch from a sound investment. We know how to negotiate. We know what is out there. We know our worth. We know how to navigate the real world. It gives us balance and a sense of control. And because we are always still learning, we know the value of knowledge and skill. For nearly 75 years at now, C has sought to bridge these gaps for the majority of our kids and for the sake of the legitimacy and longevity of our political and economic system. Nearly 75 years ago, we wrote textbooks for grades K through 12 because there were none. Today, we host a digital platform, Econ Edling, to provide teachers with an A to Z support in teaching these subjects, whether in a children's literature class or in algebra. CEE adapts to change and we drive it. Today, we're focused on eliminating opportunity gaps by focusing efforts on low and moderate income communities, our access zones. Nonetheless, on one of the key fronts for driving change, politics, I still sometimes shake my head at the uphill battle, one step forward, two steps back. There is an entrenched attitude today that concrete knowledge, the survival skills such as economics and personal finance are somehow demeaned, that there are better things to teach than those, that the idea of money should not tarnish childhood. But what are we really doing in education if not teaching kids how to survive and thrive in the real world? What are we doing if not giving them a roadmap to the fruitful plain? Hardship happens to all of us along our way. But this crisis brought home to me, our board and our staff, just how tenuous financial stability can be for many Americans and the toll that acute and constant anxiety takes on children. Just because we fail to teach them about money doesn't mean they don't worry about it. Knowledge lifts burdens. When teachers praise the support and training that CEE brings to our efforts to teach our subjects, among the very lovely words that they use, you will find relevant. Economics and personal finance education are not an entire answer. Nothing is today. But these subjects are an essential part of effective answers. The bottom line here, the measurement that counts, the smiles and optimism of our kids. And now we'll return to Steve for a fireside chat. And just remember, breathe through the pause. Here we go. Thank you, Nan. Always thoughtful and heartfelt. And thanks for your fabulous work this year and guiding the organization once again through crisis. And uh, we will be in person next time around, I'm sure. So now it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our honorees this evening, the amazing doers among us, those who use economics and finance to solve problems and bring enormous improvement to society in its wake. All of our honorees share a few traits here. As far as I can tell, focus and dedication and a bit of fanaticism, yep, seems chief among these. Nothing is too small or too large or too extraneous for their attention. They demonstrate a mastery of information that's impressive and only surpassed by their energetic application. So alphabetically beginning here. Raj Shetty, last year we spoke at length about The Economist, Raj Shetty, and his work on wealth inequality in the U.S. And only to that, he wasn't here to join the conversation, now he is. Professor Chetty is one of the youngest tenured professors in Harvard's history, also the director of Opportunity Insights, which uses big data to understand how we can give children from disadvantaged backgrounds better chances of succeeding. He's won numerous prestigious awards, but one of the more intriguing of those is the MacArthur Genius Fellowship. It's a fascinating collection of thinkers and doers. For instance, it includes a wicked tough rancher, Bill McDonald, for his conservation 
work and new approaches to ecology and community. And Raj Chetty is all about new approaches, rethinking and retooling once we know the lay of the land. Big data, which I really want to talk to him about, quantitative analysis delivers, delivers that. It's a tool for mapping our economic landscape and telling us what is really there, not just what we imagine is there. Exciting work, excuse me one second here. Exciting work both to be an explorer and a builder. Pete Stavros hailed as a change agent in the world of finance. Pete is improving employee lives along with investment returns as the co-head of US private equity for KKR, the $200 billion plus global investment firm. Excited about his work that it's actually sent me back to read another Pete, Pete Drucker, the father of modern corporate management theory. One of his key insights was that the worker is not simply a cost, but an asset. Pete is putting this in action today, focusing on the industrial and manufacturing sectors. In those sectors in particular, as you know, the working class feel disenfranchised and devalued. And listening to Pete's stories and reading about his work, I think his approach is captured by one dominant value, respecting the dignity of the worker and what they bring to a company's value. He does this by giving them a voice in the company and a share in the profits. It is transformational. For decades, Paula Valente has been putting kids to college, lots and lots of kids. She accomplished this feat by doing her job better than just about everyone else, by dominating in a male-dominated field. Paula was the chief investment officer at Bowdoin College in Maine, and her skill at managing their endowment meant that they could operate a need-blind admissions and no loan financial policy. If your kid was right for Bowdoin, he or she went to Bowdoin. I can tell you that I can do this now because she's leaving Bowdoin. My son is a rising senior at Bowdoin just coincidence. And all because Paula was beating out even the Ivy League in returns. The famous investor Stanley Druckenmiller, who I happen to know, said that she has been at the top of her field for more than a decade. Stan is also an alum of Bowdoin. A prestigious feat, by the way, for Paula. In 2020, she was named one of the 100 most influential women in U.S. finance by Barron's. Today, she is good news for New York City's recovery. She's coming here as the next Chief Investment Officer at Rockefeller University with responsibility for managing its $2.5 billion endowment. Welcome to our city, Paula. Welcome to all of our honorees. Feel free to use the uh, audience. Should Feel free to use submit a question feature for the Q&A to follow the chat. Um, and now we're going to talk for what I see here is approximately 18 minutes. That's great. Okay. So I'm going to start with Raj for one particular reason. Um, Raj, I am so fascinated right now by how we are looking and reading and following the economy with all new fabulous data sets. And this is probably the wonkiest place to start, but I'm so excited about this. Tell me what's going on right now in economics when it comes to being able to measure the economy in more real time than we ever have had before. Yeah, absolutely, Steve. So thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. A delight to join the Council of Economic Education on a set of very important issues. So to your question, Steve, I think this is a very important and exciting time in economics because the advent of new data sources has really transformed our ability to measure and understand how the economy works with incredible precision. I think an analogy to kind of the biological sciences, the invention of the compound microscope, which allowed people to really see hmm. how things work at a cellular level. Wow. We're kind of getting that kind of vision in economics from modern data sources. So you were talking about tracking the economy. I'll give you one example of a project we've been working in our group at Harvard, which is developing an, a daily economic tracker using information from things like credit cards, payroll companies, uh, lots of other transactional data sources that we've anonymized and aggregated to give people basically a real-time sense of what is happening during the COVID crisis and beyond to economic activity in their particular neighborhood. So for instance, you can look within New York, what do job loss rates look like neighborhood by neighborhood in New York City, you know, week by week. Traditional economic sources where, you know, we did surveys, we basically went around and called people up on the telephone or visited their house and asked them questions about whether they're working or not. You could never get that kind of scale and precision just because of the prohibitive costs of collecting that sort of data. Now, thanks to modern technology great. and tools of big data, we can do a great deal. Um, I'm going to switch over to Peter on this issue. Um, 
I, Raj, I need to talk to you because we have to have this conversation offline for about three hours because we're trying to develop some of this stuff and get away from the old data at CNBC because, you know, by the time something comes out a month after the month that we're talking about, you're already 70 uh, economic cycles from the actual data that's out there. Peter, how important in all of your businesses and how much data are you kicking off and how important is the data that kicks off from your business to the value of the business? How much is the data important to the value of the business? I mean, you could think of a company like First Data, which is a transaction processor, that the data that right. you, you get from, from a business like that, certainly incredibly valuable. We don't honestly have a lot of those. You know, if you think about a garage door manufacturer, the data coming out is pretty discreet and distinct to a micro market within building products, which is obviously impacted by, by housing. So I think there's some businesses like that where the underlying data is probably tremendously valuable, but we don't, we don't have a ton of them. We uh, talked to some companies, uh, UKG and uh, uh, Homebase. Those are two companies that provide us with, uh, I'm just giving an example of this. Um, they, they do work shift uh, and, and time management at companies and they aggregate that and they kick it off and they give us tons of data uh, that, that they are able to anonymize and give to us. And who knew that a company that provided time shift software was to be able to tell us about what was going to happen in the jobs report in the next month. So that's been fascinating to me. Um, Paula, let me, let me turn to you. Um, uh, thanks for doing what you did at Bowdoin, by the way. Uh, it was uh, pr pretty important and it's a heck of a school. I've been up there a couple of times to visit my son and he just, he just loves it. So um, I, help, tell me how, um, well, I'm going to start where I probably should have started to begin with. Tell me the, uh, the importance that you see in economic education and how important it is for kids coming out of high school to arrive at college for the rest of their lives with economic education. I think it's extremely um, important. I was a first generation college student. And so uh, I got out of high school. I didn't know anything. I was an art person. My background was in the arts. I pivoted later. Um, but I think that economic education is really important both for the, the kids in the school, but also for their parents. And even at Bowdoin, students take, uh, you know, economics, Keynes and all this theoretical economics. And a lot of times when they, when they come out of Bowdoin, they don't know how to negotiate a, a lease or just the basic things. And I think I was talking to uh, my daughter about balancing her checkbook and she didn't know what a checkbook was because they're doing all this electronic, you know, things are going, FinTech is taking over. But I do think that economic education and financial, um, not being afraid of money is a powerful thing. And also for the girls that are coming out of uh, high school to realize that finance, finance can provide them an incredible uh, occupation profession. I think that's really important. And I think that CE is sort of driving that. Uh, Raj, I want to ask the same question of you. Uh, what can you tell the difference between the students who come to, to, to school with an economic education and those that don't? see the very, very backgrounds that students uh, come to Harvard with, and those who've had some quantitative experience, you know, some knowledge of finance. It might come from directly from a class. Those who are fortunate enough to have such a class in high school. It might come from other sources, people who they happen to know and so forth. I think that kind of quantitative literacy and financial acumen is increasingly important for all kinds of fields. Uh, and we're finding an enormous number of students who want to have that background and are trying to catch up when they come to a place like Harvard uh, if they don't have it. So I see it as absolutely essential in the modern economy. Peter, with your focus on employees and things like employee ownership and planning, how, how important is that? And is there a way that it can happen in the workplace? Yeah, we, you know, we, we kind of see the, the downstream impact of not <clears throat> having financial literacy uh, take place in the school system. We have employees who, through this ownership program, for example, let's say they get a big payout. We sell the company. There's a, a big payout where hourly employees maybe earned 100% of their, of their income as a one-time payout on their equity. And what, what can happen if they're not prepared is they can spend the money while they're in debt. Uh, so, you know, we've had some hmm. 
early on experience of not preparing people for financial windfalls like that and seeing the downstream impact of them not being financially literate to begin with. And, and the interesting thing about CEE is it gives us an opportunity to go upstream in that same community. So we're, we do provide financial literacy training in the company. And then in that same community, we try and go upstream with CEE um, in, into the school system. Peter, I'm going to just stick with you and ask you to uh, take a couple steps back uh, and explain to people this fund that you're doing. What, what is this fund to promote employee ownership um, and how is it going to change the world that we know? So it's a, a foundation uh, that we're launching in, in the fall. Uh, it, the, the provisional name is Center for Shared Ownership, which our early funders have told me they hate, so we'll probably change it. Um, but <laughs> the concept is that uh, you know, making all employee owners, to so take Ingersoll Rand, a, a public company that we used to own, there's 16,000 people across dozens of countries, all of whom have ownership. The low, in, the low income uh, cohorts of that company have about a half a billion dollars of stock today. Nothing like that uh, has, ever, ever, has ever been done before, in part because it's awfully complicated to, to issue stock to thousands and thousands of employees all over the world. So what we do this, this nonprofit is first going to help people through the tax, legal, accounting, administrative burden, structuring, thinking through vesting, retention requirements. There's like a million micro problems to solve if you're going to broaden ownership to a whole company. And then from there, it's about how you build culture. How can you use 16,000 employee owners using that example and build a stronger company so people quit less, are happier on the job? You can see it through measured employee engagement scores. Uh, have better health outcomes, better safety, uh, et cetera, and better financial uh, literacy skills. So that's that's one part. And then the second part to your point about how we're going to really change things, we're trying to build a movement. I mean, if if we're all tired of wealth inequality, the economy is just a collection of companies. So it's going to have to happen at the company level. We're not going to get anywhere with wealth for low-income colleagues if we have all of the ownership in the hands of 1% of employees of a company, often mostly in the hands of a half dozen. Um, which is what you see. Typically, one to two percent of employees have ownership, and it's very concentrated at the top. So those are the those are the two things we're trying to do. I'm sorry to stick with you on this, because I'm going to pivot to Paula in a second. But quickly, um, do you make the case to Paula that she should invest in these companies because of employee ownership? Hundred percent. Yeah, I, I think you're paying for. I think you should trade at higher multiples. You're paying for culture. You're you're paying for a more stable employee base that is more engaged, you know, just think about the impact that can have on product quality, on people being bought in on, on whatever the value creation objectives are, scrap reduction, customer satisfaction, what have you. If you've got more aligned employees who are less likely to quit and on a measured basis are, are more engaged on the job, right. I would say absolutely put your trade at higher multiples. Paula, are you all in there? Yes, I am. I think that ESG, that's the S um, part of the ESG. Jillian Tett once said that ESG is eye roll, sigh, and groan. What, that's what it's used to stand for, but now it's becoming more and more important in how we look at our investments and how our managers look at our portfolios. As you say, if you have a good workforce that is supported and um, you know, educated about finance and all that, they will do a much better job. And so I think we that's definitely going to become more and more important as we, uh, you know, try to attack the d divide between the haves and the have nots, which we definitely need to do. All right. Now I got to do some work because I got to be on TV tomorrow talking about the economy. So, Paul, I'm going to stick with you on this. Um, one of the big stories right now is inflation. How concerned are you? Is there a way that you're thinking about positioning your portfolio for temporary or permanent inflation? What, what are your thoughts on that? Inflation is a very big topic. And um, I talked to Stan Druckenmiller and Kevin Warsh yesterday wrote a nice uh, editorial in the Wall Street Journal about this, um, you know, the worries of inflation. Right now, it's, try, it's hard to figure out what it would be a hedge against inflation. Is it real estate? Is it gold? Is it tips? Is it the same old things? Is it Bitcoin? You know, I think some people would say that. I do think that there's this pent up demand um, in the economy for people to get out and do things. So I think the stock market is very frothy right now in certain areas. I also live in Maine. When I drive to work, there's everywhere there's help wanted signs. 
where they're offering, you know, a higher in, uh, employee, you know, higher pay. So I do think inflation is going to be a big um, impact. It's more unexpected inflation, like an inflation shock that I'm more worried about. Um, and then also the change in the methodology on how you calculate inflation is something that we have to get our arms around too. But um, we have a lot of growth and innovation. Someone said that innovation could be a hedge against uh, inflation, which is an interesting thought. Hmm. Raj, I want to turn to you. Um, what does the history tell us about this? Um, I, you're, I've been saying, hey, we don't really know what this looks like. Nobody knows what this looks like. Was this inflation where at least to for some point in time where demand outstrips supply and, and that people come back to the stores before the employers do. Was that to be expected? Is there Are there analogs to follow on this? I mean, I think clearly this recession and this crisis has no precedent in terms of the particular structure. My sense is that, you know, from the data we've looked at, others have compiled, it looks like things are kind of out of equilibrium in a sense that, you know, the ty types of things that Paul was describing help wanted ads, you know, at the same time that lots of people are unemployed, the supply and demand don't really seem to be intersecting in the way that we would traditionally teach our students. And so my hope is that in a few months, uh, things start to converge. And as a result, you get prices starting to re-equilibrate and so forth. Now, can we look to a historical guide and say, this is what happened, you know, in the financial crisis or in a previous recession? I think that's hard to do because you've had a very unusual and specific nature of shutdowns of production in this crisis that hasn't been rivaled in the past. So for what it's worth, I did a story today looking at everybody's talking about the unemployment benefits, keeping people on the sidelines, child care. I think all of those things are true, but there's a couple other things that are out there, which is some 2 million extra people retired during this crisis. Um, you've had a decline in immigration. Uh, I'm here in Cape Cod. They don't have their workers from Bulgaria who normally come over. I think that's true in resort towns up and down the East Coast and in America. Peter, talk about your companies now. Is it difficult to find workers right now? And are you paying extra? And do you find it to be, you believe it's a temporary phenomenon or permanent? It's extremely hard to find people uh, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a labor side, that garage door company I was mentioning, I'll just give you an example. So this is a company in central Illinois, you know, this, so maybe a couple hours from Indianapolis, uh, three and a half hours from Chicago. So it's a little bit remote and not a lot of it, you know, labor coming in, into the market. And we've been fighting with local employers at this company for labor. So we would take our starting wage from you know, 16 to 18 an hour, the other employers would go to 20, we'd go to 22. And then wow. just last week, one of the employers went to $48 an hour. It's only guaranteed for three months, but $48 an hour. Um, and, and look to the broader point on in inflation that use that same company as an example, raw materials are completely out of control if you can even get them. Um, so th you look at that garage door industry, an average year, you'd have price increases in the industry from 0% to 2%. A hot year, maybe it's 3%. Year to date, prices are up 40% in the industry. Uh, so, I mean, just think about that. Somebody who was looking for a garage door in December uh, to, to June, that was a thousand bucks is $1,400. I mean, I definitely am worried about demand destruction in some of these industries. What do you do in response to that if you can't get the workers? Does it keep you? Are, are your is your production level below where it was last year as a result of not having? And I guess I'm not sure what the benchmark is anymore. We can't we can't figure out what our baselines are. We have to go back to 2019, really. But in in comparison to what would be normal, are you below that because you can't find the workers? We are. I mean, so one way to look at it would be lead times. So our typical lead time would be a week in that company. So you order a garage door. Let's say you're a garage door installer. We would typically have it to you in in seven days from when you order it. Uh, we're at eight weeks right now, um, wow. and the industry is at fourteen to sixteen weeks. Wow, Paula. I, as I understand it, inflation is not bad for all stocks. It's bad for some stocks, and that has to do with pricing power, and it has to do with profit margin. It has to do with operating margin, all kinds of fun stuff like that. Tell me how you look when it comes to just the stock market. I know you invest in all kinds of things, but 
just stocks when it, and how you factor in and think about companies when it comes to inflation? Well, I think one of the things about inflation is you have this commodity inflation that's happening and you have a shortage of chips, for instance, for autos. And as Peter was saying, there's this whole supply uh, chain that has been disrupted through the pandemic. It used to be a just-in-time inventory, and now that's not working so well because the materials that you need to build your inventory are uh, there's a you know a, a problem in getting those. So, uh, in looking at the companies in inflation, I think equities should do well in a, in a moderate inflation period. But um, it, again, it's the shock. But I do think that some of the supply chain, and then you see oil, which might who knew it might hit $100 again. And so I think that it depends sector by sector on, on the influence of uh, inflation. And then you also see some of the, like the SaaS companies and the technology companies th that are sort mm -hmm. of soaring. And they, are, you know, most of those are sticky uh, uh, subscription models, and maybe those are not going to be hit so much by inflation or they can rise, raise prices. Um, I, I'm afraid that's all the time that I have for questions. I'm going to bring Nan Morrison back in. Nan, do we have questions from the audience, or did I did I did I mess you up and 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 blow through that time for that? No, no, it was it's such a great discussion. I I wish we could go for a long time, um, but we do have some questions from the the crew. So this one comes from uh, Loretta Mester, who's the head of the Cleveland Fed, uh, because we don't want to lighten up on you guys after Steve. So. Uh, her question is, do you have any concerns that the micro data will lead policymakers to be too reactive to very short term changes? That might be a, even a Raj question. Thanks, Loretta, for that. I mean, certainly, I think the way we use these <coughs> data is extremely important. And so one of the things that we've been working on is trying to benchmark them against the traditional slower moving statistics that we're all used to seeing from things like the current population survey. and. I can imagine, you know, if you naively react to every fluctuation in these data, that can lead to overreaction by policymakers. But I think one of the things we have to learn is how do we extract the longer term signals uh, that we should be paying attention to in these new micro data sources? And how do we kind of filter out the noise? And I think that's going to be one of the scientific challenges for the field to figure out in the coming years. And this crisis has given us an opportunity to start to figure that out. I'm just going to agree real quickly with that, um, which is I deal with this stuff every day and it's real messy. It's real noisy and trying to get signal from it, even even as exciting as all these data sets are, is very challenging. And I, I'd like to note that I just I talked to Howard Marks a little while ago and he was remind, he was remembering back to when you had to do research on a company and you had to wait for them to send you the annual report. And now we're barraged. <laughs> We have too much data. And so the signals are just so, uh, you know, I, I just pictured Howard there waiting for his mail. <laughs> Very good. So um, uh, we have a question from Arkady Coleman. Uh, it's from Peter. Do you have a view on investment opportunities in online learning to leverage more knowledge in economics and finance to reach more students? So to the investor. It sounds like a great idea. I don't know of one in particular to go after with that exact um, profile, but you, look, everything's going the, the, online. I mean, the, the the whole COVID crisis across industries has just accelerated that digitization trend. So it certainly sounds interesting. I mean, it does sort of raise a question. I don't know if Paula can talk about this though, but uh, my son um, did not do the first semester virtual. He took off that six months and he had a grand old time, did a lot of work, went back for the second six months and it was sort of partially virtual. I don't know what you're hearing. Maybe, Nan, you answer this question. Are you hearing from universities that there are parts of the virtual education that were successful and will remain? So, you know, I never quite got out of high school on the education front. I'm a K through 12 girl. <laughs> My mom used to say that she never got past second grade because that's what she taught. Um, I think it's been a really, really mixed, mixed bag this year for students. Yeah. And my big concern on the education front is where everybody else is right now, is the kids who really need to be in school to, to learn, learn it all, right? Because they're not hearing the English language. 
They may not have parents who are um, uh, English speakers, native English speakers, and mm -hmm. they're they're really going to be put at a disadvantage. Um, and that is that is my my big concern, and that's going to affect people even at the community college level and at some some colleges across the country. You you'll see it slightly differently, but um, I'm really concerned about those super basic skill sets mm -hmm. uh, for the students who really need to be with. A, an, a real educator every every day. I mean, we all know the list of hardships that the kids face face at home uh, when they can't be in that classroom environment. We've seen it a lot this year in our in some of our virtual offerings. Ask a happier gotcha. question. Yeah. <laughs> that, no, that's a good, good, good Paula. Yeah, professors have, uh, you know, they really uh, had to dive in to adapt and be flexible and pivot to use technology and i think that there are things that they will keep that are hybrid things that they saw that their students really uh, you know profited from but i agree with nan that it's going to be really good to get the students back in the classroom so this is really a, a great question uh that is, is a post-pandemic issue which is um I don't know, uh, Roger, if you saw the paper by Stephen Davis and others from Chicago where they did all these interviews and they think um, work at home was 5% before the pandemic, it ratcheted up to something like 50%. And I think it's gonna come back down to 20%. And and they, among others, I think Goldman Sachs is one of them. Um, uh, Jeffries wrote a nice piece on this, are positing this pretty substantial productivity boom that comes from the pandemic um, and, and I'm trying to cause a coin a phrase here, which is that necessity in this case was the mother of adoption. We had all these technologies around and nobody thought to use them in this way and we're using them. And, and, and what Nan said is, is, is as significant in the workplace for young people coming up as it is uh, in, in the schools. Because, you know, if you're a young person, you want to get seen by Peter. I want Peter to see me and see how hard I'm working. But if I'm at home, I can't do that. But if you're a guy like me and I don't much care anymore, I don't care if Peter sees me, he's either going to fire me or keep me on board. Um, I don't know. Do we have a second hand for Peter to talk about this issue of work at home and does any of it remain? And, and maybe Raj can say a word about that. We're probably out of time, but what are you going to do? Sure. Go, go ahead. <laughs> um, sure, I, I can start. So work from home f for us and at our companies, I, I think that you're right. Some of that's going to stay you know, in this war for talent, if you have no flexibility, you're not going to be competitive. At the same time, it's hard to build culture remotely. And a lot of these jobs are apprenticeship jobs where I just do think you need to sit with people and sit as a team and figure stuff out together. I just I just don't think it's going to work um, if we if we have if we go too far down the remote side. So I don't know. We're, we're probably somewhere in the middle. We'll, we're going to give some flexibility. We, we have a very, very strong culture we're sensitive to. Um, and we believe that this is an apprenticeship uh, job, you know, at, at least what we do. And I think in the finance world, there's a, I think there's a broad feeling you've got to get people together in person. Raj, two, you got two minutes. That's what they tell me on TV all the time. You got two minutes, go ahead. I'd agree very much with what uh, Peter just said. I mean, speaking from personal experience, both to this question and the last one, right, as a professor who taught uh, remotely during the past year, my sense is there are certain advantages for some students. There are actually some benefits of having that kind of access. You can learn at your own pace and so forth to some extent. Um, but clearly, you know, in the ideas sector and the technology innovation sector, there's tremendous benefit to being in the same place. I don't think that's going to go away. So I think the Steve Davis, Nick Bloom kind of estimates of moving to a 20% work from home sounds very plausible to me. And I think that could actually there's going to be some sweet spot, right? There are trade-offs between the two things, 100% work from home, 100% going to the office. Those are two extremes unlikely to be the optimal thing somewhere in the middle that I think will end up landing. And now that we've seen this possibility of doing things online, that it can actually kind of work, um, I imagine we'll find that middle ground that hopefully will benefit lots of folks. I, I miss having this conversation with you folks in person. I do not miss the George Washington Bridge. Nan, back to you. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Uh, I, I agree with Steve. I always agree with Steve. It's just safer that way. Um, I have one more big question on, on the economy for all of you. Uh, how concerned, this comes from Graham Tanaka, one of our board members, how concerned are you about the expected rise in the federal budget deficit and federal debt as a percent of GDP? And what's the best, well, how concerned are you 
about about those things. That's a little bit of a lens uh, looking into the future um, because there's a lot going on right now in Washington besides infrastructure. I am very Paula? worried. I'm, I'm worried for our children. And, and that's why what you're doing at Council for Economic Education is so important because this is going to trickle through to our children and our grandchildren's, you know, possibility and future. I, th I think it's very scary. And I, you know, I sort of, it's like, I feel like we're playing musical chairs again, once more again with uh, sort of this, uh, you know, excess. And I'll open up to the rest of the group. Raj or Peter? I, I think I'd echo that. I would put it in a, in a broader perspective of we have tremendous unfunded liabilities that we had even before in the context of the Social Security system, Medicare, and so forth, that created exactly the types of concerns that Paula is describing. And the current debt burden that's being added, you know, amplifies that. But there is that deep underlying uh, set of fiscal issues to begin with. And I think we shouldn't lose sight of having to address that longer term problem, uh, you know, hopefully this crisis can help focus attention on those uh, deeper long term issues. Yeah, and I, I don't have much to add, Steve, I, I would just say I worry about the dollar crashing long term and, and what that could mean for inflation in a world where we're already worried about inflation. I'm going to add that I remain open to learning what the limitations are for the fiscal budget deficit. Those that we thought there were do not seem to have held and created the calamities that people expected. And I think historically there are there is wide latitude for the reserve currency of the world to run large deficits, although I worry about them. I think we're good. I think I think we're good. Um, so I would like to say thank you all. What a great chat. We covered a lot of territory. Um, this is my most favorite opportunity where I get to thank our great friend, Steve Leisman, who does so much for us and who carried us through this evening. I really could not have done it without you. It always scares me when you get stuck on the bridge. I'm so glad that you still got to enjoy Cape Cod and they were not a, the same kind of obstacle. So thank you so, so much. Thanks. Um, and of course, thanks to all of you who attended, uh, all of you who gave. We got some nice donations this evening and I'd like to just have a big toast to our board of directors, our hardworking and patient staff, our MC again, our honorees again, and all of our behind the scene helpers uh, and everyone else who might be wandering around. Uh, we really appreciate it all. Uh, feel free to hang out at your tables. They'll be open for the next 30 minutes to enjoy the company of your friends and colleagues. And then I love saying this, go out and enjoy the summer because we are almost done and we will see you next April all together live in New York. Thanks so much, everyone. Good evening.